Right. Look at the That's it. Come on. To another Liquid Bullet Productions with us today is Mr. Wolfie Foxlow. Hey, hey, hey. Hey. Well, yeah, nice nice you, man. Thank you very much for being here. Lovely. So, Wolfie, you're an old school mod. Yeah. And also, you're friends with the band The Who. That that's correct? correct, yeah, that's right. You've right. done your research. Well, a very yeah. smart dresser, I must say. <laughs> Thank you very much. A dedicated <laughs> follower of fashion. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it. So, can we just start from the yeah. beginning, Wolfie? So, yes. where you grew up and, you know, your yeah, yeah. upbringing, etc., etc. Yeah, yeah. Um, Born in North London, Wood Green, on the edge of Tottenham. Yeah. Uh, born in the front room in 1963. Good year that was. And um, from there, I sort of my had an instant love affair from earliest memories with scooters and bubble cars. Yeah. Um, so fascinated with that, really. Um, so grew up there. Um, discovered the Who after that really rubbish period of glam rock. You know. Yeah. We got through that. Got rid of the flares and the ridiculous long hair and <laughs> Freddie Laker collars. All that went straight out the bloody window. And um, Quadrophenia came out, you know. Yeah. Um, what was that? Was that 70s or 80s? That, that was 79. 79. It was released in 79. But before that, prior to that, I, um, I got into the mod thing through The Who. Mm -hmm. So I was sort of edging my ways towards a mod thing before the release of Quadrophenia. So you could say mod before quad. Right, yeah. that was me, really, but on the outskirts, you know. Um, everyone just thought I was some kind of fucking freak, you know what I mean? Because, uh, uh, well, we've jumped from that to the mod thing, you know what I mean? Um, so I went from being, yeah, a sort of long-haired layabout into, uh, I'd like to think I was a pretty much cool geezer in, in the mod thing, you know what I yeah. mean? Um, so the air came off, and uh, when I was at school, the, the fat tie got turned around the other way, you know what I mean? The, the Freddie Laker collar turned into a Ben Sherman button down, slim tie, flares went out the window, 14 inch bottoms. I walked into school, people thought I was a freak. Do you know what I mean? I thought, what the fuck? What's wrong? What happened to you overnight? Yeah. I saw my mod. What the fuck's a mod? No one knew what a mod was. And then, um, what, three or four months later, Quadrophenia came out. They all dressed like me, didn't they? They're all mods. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm thinking, well, <laughs> There you go, mate. So, for me, that was... So it started at an early age then, so sort of your teens. Uh, 15, I was 15. 15. Yeah, 14 and a half, 15 when, when I was got introduced to The Who. Yeah. I was in a kid's home. I had a bit of a troubled childhood as well. Right. Parents got divorced, got messy. I was brought up, brought up with living nannies, au pair girls and that, and it all went a bit wonky. And um, so I went off the rails a little bit. Uh, ended up in a care system, which uh, didn't do me any favours. Assessment centres was like, a big problem for me. Um, psychologists, psychiatrists poking about in your brain, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it wasn't very good for one's ego, you know what I mean? But ended up in a community home and that was fucking great. I loved that. And that is where one of the older guys introduced me to The Who. He goes, stop listening to that rubbish and listen to this. And he sat me down in the record room 
And I listened to them and I thought, wow, they're actually telling a story. You know, Pete Townsend's writing was amazing. It sort of blew me away. I thought, they're actually telling a story. So it's all stuff that I could relate to. There were these four loud Larry geezers from London. Sort of suited me, you know what I mean? They had yeah. aggression, attitude, chip on the shoulder. Think the, the world owed them something. Pretty much me in the care system, being aggressive, young man, and all that, you know, suited me down the ground. I couldn't believe it. It was if the Who were made for me. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, Quadrophenia came out. And then, like I said, when I was little, earliest memories, scooters, bubble cars, they all connected together. So it was a final piece of the jigsaw. And so where I was an angry young little shit <laughs> with no future or nothing to aim for, now I've got something to focus on. Yeah. Excuse the pun, but there was a target there and I wanted to head for the bullseye. And that gave me, gave me freedom to think, um, it established who I was, who I wanted to be, where I was going to go in life. Um, and all to do with Pete Townsend's writing, really, and Keith Moon, you know, the whole package. It was sort of made for me. And that was it. And I had a, a, my own self-esteem. You know, I wanted to look smart. I wanted to pull the birds. I wanted to have a laugh. I wanted to go out and a razzle. You know what I mean? To do that, you need money. So I was going to get a job. And started to be independent. And I've seriously put all that down to that band. Gave me something to focus on. Quadrophenia, the whole mod thing, the whole, the whole, the writing in Brighton, you know, is anti-establishment. Being an anarchist, that was me. Yeah. Being an angry young kid, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, so it suited me down to the ground, and that's 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 the story of my yeah. life, really. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so what sort of um, what sort of stage? Obviously, there was when the mods come in. There was also sort of like the, the skinheads and the punks and different yeah. groups around at that time as well, weren't there? Yeah. Well, we had a lot. Of, <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of trouble then, fuckers. <laughs> can I swear on this? I can swear. Yeah, yeah the bastards. <laughs> no, I mean, listen. Yeah, they were they, they were violent times in the eighties. They were they really were. Um, you had a, a lot of racism back then, you know, um, which we aren't, you know, because we're into the black music, soul, ska, you know, two-tone yeah. and all that. So very much black orientated music, it's all that sort of stuff. So we wasn't into that racist thing, but a lot of the footballers were. So there was trouble on the terraces, racism. We had, the, we had trouble with casuals. Now, the casuals were skinheads originally, I think, from the London area especially, and the casual, uh, the skinheads sort of morphed into casuals and they carried razors and all that, mm. you know, Tashini and all that they used to wear. We hated them and they hated us. So there's always that rivalry between us, the skinheads, the casuals. And then when we'd finish beating each other up, then the punks would start on us and then we'd start on the punks and the skinheads would beat the punks up, the punks would beat the skinheads up. They'd beat us up, we'd <laughs> give them a good idea back, you know. And every Saturday down Carnival Street was the same. It was ridiculous, it got so violent. Um, and I took some right good items, you know what I mean? Yeah. I remember curling up into a ball and just punches and kicks were going into me. I mean, I was pilled out of me a nut at the time, so I didn't feel anything. <laughs> Until the next day. <laughs> Until the next day, and it felt like I'd been fucking run over by a train, do you know yeah. what I mean? And I remember thinking, uh, oh, this is all right, I can handle this, is that all we've got? And I'm curled up into a ball in a shop doorway in Soho, getting the shit kicked out of me. And I was sort of giggling away because I couldn't, I was so off my tits, I, you know, I didn't feel a fucking thing. And I, and I remember thinking, I can handle this. I just don't want to feel a knife go through. Yeah. That's what was going through my head. Right? I didn't want that. I've always had the fear of getting stabbed. I never did. So thank heavens for that. But, um, so yeah, so very violent times. Lot of, lots of uh, racism and rioting. And I mean, the, the only reason why it got overshadowed is because of all the aggro and terrorists. That, that took all of the, the red top papers was focusing all on that. So it didn't, so as far as the publicity, the bad publicity that the mods were getting, we sort of evaded that a little bit. But they had enough of that in the 60s, didn't they? You know what I mean? <laughs> they made headlines in the 60s. So we were just sort of carrying it on, I suppose. But nothing malicious, nothing. We wasn't out looking for trouble. We just, it came to us. Yeah. The trouble came to the mods. You know, I went one of these geezers. No, that's not, I'm not fucking stupid. Do you know what I mean? You know, I, I remember luck, like, because obviously where we are in South End on the bank holiday Mondays, used to get from all over the skinheads had come yeah. the mods especially the whole seafront it would be yeah. absolutely lot like rivals yeah, like yeah. gangs everywhere like yeah that. and I, I know the same was in brighton wasn't it yeah same yeah. in brighton it's all, all over really clacton margate you know they just recreated the 60s this is what happened and the thing is you know because it's going back to the who and because don't forget the 1973 album quadrophenia so 10 years after the riots 
and Pete wrote Quadrophenia, the album. And then five years later, he turned it into a movie. Everyone had moved on from the 60s and was, they'd moved on to do other things and whatever. But um, what happened was then, um, Quadrophenia came out and it went global. Yeah. It wasn't a fashion, it became a movement, you know, and it, and it spread its tentacles throughout Europe and then now it's Japan, it's Australia, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. All because of Pete's writing. So he is the messiah, right? Because he's got millions of followers because of Quadrophenia. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's what spurred off the, uh, the mod revival was Quadrophenia, as simple as that. Of course, you had the jam, special, selector and everything else. And there's all part of the package, Purple Arts, all right, Jeff? Uh, they, all, they all come together. But it was like one big package. It all happened at the right time, the right place. Yeah. And so it wasn't just Quadrophenia, but it was all the other mainstream pop music of the time that yeah. was coming out, you know. So just, just to jump back from, yeah. to when you're sort of, you're 15 now, yeah. you've turned into this mod. Yeah. So how, how was this sort of life from day, day to day? What sort of things was you doing, getting up to? Oh, Jesus. I mean, listen, I was still in the kids' home at the time, right. in St Albans, uh, Lemsford Road. It, it was a great place. And uh, our governor, Mr. Hillman, he, he died recently. Um, so overnight, I sort of became a mod. And so the day-to-day -day thing was, right, I see at weekend, I'm going up to St Albans Town Centre. I put my park on, I've got my Ben Sherman, got my inch wide tie, I'm having it. <laughs> and I had my Union Jack badge, I had a Union Jack tea towel sewed on the back of my parka. You know what I mean? It was all... Yeah, I remember the parka, they used to have badges all sort of sewn on everywhere, didn't they? Yeah. But they, did they mean different stuff or was it? Nah, not really. I mean, no. I mean, it's just got a bit ridiculous, really. Um, I mean, I suppose you had like your favourite band or whatever, they'd have like the Secret Fair patch on there, the Who or whatever on your back, you know. Or just where you come from, you know what I mean? The name of your scooter club, so just anything really. It's just like an extension of your personality, you yeah. know what I mean? So the day-to-day -day thing, so I remember getting my park and I put on a Union Jack and my badges, the specials and all that, and I walked down and I'm trying to evade the governor of the children's zone, Mr Hillman, but he caught me coming down the stairs on my way out the front door and he turned around and said to me, and where the bloody hell do you think you're going dressed up like a Christmas tree? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget that, you know what I mean? I thought yeah. that was so funny. And he's looking at your badges and I see the specials bag and he goes, badge? And he goes, and what's so special about you? You know, he really is trying to put me down. He goes, yeah. you ain't going uptown like that and I take it off. So I wait till he's outside, took it off. When he's gone, put it on, straight up the town. <laughs> so he was just having a laugh. We'd go up to the Wimpy Bar, hang out at the Wimpy Bar. You know, we'd just drink Coke and pop, you know, I was only 15. Yeah. Um, so nothing heavy. That came later. <laughs> was it ecstasy then or blues? Blues, yeah, blues, blues, black bombers. You know, what I mean, they were still about. Yeah, the blues. I used to buy three for a quid. So what? What were they? What was that? Amphetamine. Oh, amphetamine. Slimming tablets, really. Right. But they used to give you a right buzz. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that that came about a little bit later. That was about six months after what I'm talking about. So <laughs> not not that much later. And. Um, so yeah, then we used to pop pills. But hey, really, basically, it's all innocent stuff. We'd, yeah. we'd hang out at a wimpy pop. We went, you'd go and see a gig, or there'd be like a, um, down a local youth club. There'd be a DJ and he'd be spinning like green onions and you know Bucatini MGs and all that sort of thing. It's all good, innocent fun, really. But I remember um, one one little story. Uh, I was about fifteen. I was in a youth club. And everyone's sort of trying to dance like madness or sting out quadrophenia. You know? They're all trying to look, look ridiculous, but we're just kids. We learn, it's a learning curve, you know what I mean? And what happened was, uh, I had this bird with me, and we walked out of the, uh, out of the youth club, and there was a, a burger van there, right? And there was this geezer sitting on his motorbike, a fizzy FS1, right? A little 50 Yamaha. He was sitting on that, and he had a full face crash helmet on with his visor, and he's waiting to pick his girlfriend up, right? And my mate, he, he wanted to make a bit of a name for himself, he said, hey, hey, Wolfie, watch this. So he went up to the burger van, and he ordered a burger, and he goes, I want mustard, tomato sauce, chilli sauce, onions, fucking extra cheese, I want a lot on it. So he put it all on, right? And I'm watching, I thought, so what's so great about him buying a burger? And he went up to his skis, sit on the motorbike, lift up his visa, ah. splattered it, <laughs> twisted it round and shut the visa back down. Oh dear. <laughs> so that, and he just sat there, this poor bloke, he just sat there <laughs> with his cheeseburger stuffed in his face. And I, so that was the first sign of mod rocker rivalry, if you like. Yeah, gotcha. Silly stuff. <laughs> but it sticks in my head. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen at that time. So all innocent stuff, you know what I mean? No punch-ups, no serious fucking drug taking, you know. Um, so basically that was it. Just go to the local youth clubs, got the old, went to the old 
uh, the odd gig at the Civic Hall, see the Body Snatchers, I think was the first gig I saw. Two tone band, really good. So what sort of age is that now when you're still 15, 15, coming in, 15, coming into 16. Yeah. Um, 16, I probably, because Quadrophenia came out, I think, September 79. So I would have been 16 in November. So yeah, so towards 16. So that's the way I was at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't have a scooter, nothing, still too young. But I started. Well, when did that come in, the scooter sort of stage? The scooter stage, um, that came in quite late actually because I was always out on the town. Do you know what I mean? I was too busy. I, I, I was such a scatterbrain. You know, I too drunk to drive. <laughs> too drunk, too off the tits. Insurance, MOTs. What's all that about? Yeah. No, I can't be asked with that. So I didn't get my first scooter until about 83 actually, 80 to 83. Yeah. Um, a little Vespa 100, mirrors, lights everywhere, you know, and right over the top, it's just... Yeah, they, they look quite good, them old scooters, they have all the lights yeah, and the yeah, fairings. Yeah, and I love them, man, I love yeah. them, I still, still today, I love them. I mean, years ago, in the 80s, when I was a kid, you used to uh, see, like, groups from everywhere just going around. Like, yeah. I mean, from time to time, you still see them now and again, but, yeah. you know, it's not as big thing, is Nah, it? not as big as it was. I mean, I think the closest we got to having another revival since 79 was the early 90s when Britpop exploded onto the screens, you know what I mean? The Oasis, Social Colour Scene, yeah. all that. That was sort of a mini sort of mod revival, but it didn't quite hit the mark, you know what I mean? So, so yeah, so that's, that's where I was at 16. Um, then I moved back down to London, got myself a half sensible job, started to earn a bit of dough, and that was it. It was just 100 mile an hour all the way from then on. It was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and I fucking, I was good at it. I was really good at it. I still am. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, great times, best times of my life. Great to be alive, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So, so when did you get, actually get in touch with the, the band The Who? What sort of age did this come about? Well, um, well how did it, how did it how did come, come about? about? Yeah, yeah, that old chestnut. Um, well, I've done a bit of promotion work, you know what I mean? Uh, Stage manager, I manage bands and put gigs on and stuff. So, oh, right. so I sort of sort of done that a bit, and then um, it was this chance meeting with some people that were connected with the Who. Really, Irish Jack, he was one of them. He ends up good friend. We're still good friends, me and Irish Jack. And that Irish Jack, he was the one that uh, he was the one in, in 1962, 63 that would put up posters everywhere to promote the Who. Mm -hmm. If uh, if there was a record released by the Who, Jack would know where to go, what record shop to go in West End to buy as many records so it would get up the charts. Right. So he was like the unofficial promoter, if you like, the fifth member of The Who, he's known as. And he's, he's a lovely fella. Um, so I sort of had a chance meeting with him um, in Soho, Broadwick Street of all places. Um, and I was about to go to Japan to see The Who, um, and I told him that, and he managed to get me a backstage pass. So that was like the first meeting, meeting The Who. Um, and then I befriended Doug Sandham. We ended up best of friends, and he was the original member of the Who, uh, drummer before Keith Moon, right? Now, he died a few years ago. He was my, one of my best friends. He was such a lovely bloke. Um, so it was a chance meeting with these people, how I sort of got my foot on the ladder. Yeah. It just happened. I wasn't out <laughs> to find my heroes. I'm not like that, but it just happened. And then I went as a Simon Townsend gig, Pete's brother. Um, and I met him at Who Convention, that's right, in Shepherd's Bush. And I said, oh, all right, blah, blah, blah. I'm a promoter, I can get you gigs. Here's my card. And it sort of ended up like that. I ended up, well, traveling all over the world with them, you know what I mean? Like I said, uh, most people would spend a weekend or, or a week or two in Ibiza or something like that. I took three months off work and went on tour, went on tour with you, you know what I mean? Are we? Yeah. Must have seen a few, like, experienced a few things. Good things. Is my mum going to watch this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen quite a few things. <laughs> yeah, I can't say too much because these people are still alive, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't fucking liable, you know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah, fucking amazing times, man. I've written a book, it's a shameless plug, is coming out, uh, hopefully in December, it's called Stroking Walls. And yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a biography, um, and it goes through my whole life, obviously, um, and ends up, on tour with a who, so it's yeah. almost like a rags to riches story, but without the riches, only the riches that are made in my head, the memories. So, so when you was on tour with a who, who yeah. was you actually going round with them, like to the after parties, the concerts, all of it, mate, everything, yeah. Oh, well, I've done a lot. I've done <laughs> a fucking lot, man. You wouldn't believe it. After show parties, oh god, it's ridiculous. There's so much going on. My wife at the time, 
Well, she, obviously she she couldn't handle it. You know what I mean? She fucked off after a while. I remember her saying to me, "You're going off the rails." I'm worried about you. Yeah. I says, "I've never been on the fucking rails. How can I go off them?" Yeah. You know what I mean? You knew what it's like when you met me. Mate, changing. You know, if if you want to grow up and get boring, that's fine. But don't drag me down with you. Off she went. So yeah, and a lot of that was to do with my party days with the Who and stuff. And well, not with the Who. Every day's a party in my head. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just enjoy life. So yeah, I've done a lot. Private jets, bloody commercial airlines with them. Um, huge, um, what they call them, the big bloody tour buses with the extending lounge and. It's like going to a Star Trek movie, you know, that's <laughs> fucking amazing, yeah. So done all that, toured everywhere, done the lot, all across the Canada, America, Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, everywhere really, apart from Syria, you know what I mean? <laughs> Afghanistan, Iraq, <laughs> didn't go there, there. That, didn't <laughs> do them. So yeah, done all that, yeah, amazing. Time of my life, I, I, luckiest man alive, really. I, I'd see some of your photos as well, so you sort of met... Quite a lot of famous people as well on your travels, haven't you? No, they met me. They met you. Get it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I met a lot of famous people and Quite most, a lot of the A-listed names, aren't they? In the... Big names. Yeah, yeah. Partied with them. Yeah, drunk with them. Done cocaine with them. Mushrooms. <laughs> Split everything. <laughs> you can edit this if you want. But um, yeah, yeah. Done done a lot. But uh, met some really lovely people. I'll tell you something. The only I don't think, oh, there was one bloke that I didn't particularly like and he was a bit up himself, was Bono from U2. Yeah. He was a bit of a dick. No photos, no photos. I said, I didn't even ask you for your fucking photo, mate. You know what I mean? But he was probably the only one. But all the other A-listers and rock stars and film stars, and they've all been really nice, polite, considerate people. Not up themselves. Not the image that you'd expect. They think, oh, you can't, he's unapproachable. Yeah. I don't know if it's because of my connection with a band that that was nice to me, or they was just genuinely, I don't know. But yeah, met some amazing people, had some great, had some well, great um, Just be at least like, name a few, I don't know, big names for us that you've met. Yeah, 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 Jack Black, one of them, Kaifa or Kiefer, Sutherland, um, Bob Dylan, uh, oh God, there's so many, so, oh, what's that geezer? Uh, who was the keys that was married to Madonna? Madonna. Uh, Guy Ritchie. No, no, not Guy Ritchie. No, the other guy. Uh, the, the other guy. The actor, the American actor. Oh, um... Oh. We went to a party at his house. It will come to you, it will come to you. Yeah. We went to a party after the Who. This is in Los Angeles, downtown, uh, on Sunset. He lived on Sunset. And um, he... Uh, We'd done the, done the gig... And then Simon goes, oh, well, let's go round to so-and-so's house. What's his fucking name? I can't remember. I can't remember. Anyway, it will come to me. <laughs> so we went, went to his house and uh, Sean Penn, right? Yeah. Sean Penn. And he, he lives in this, on Sunset, he lives in this beautiful Art Deco building on top of Sunset. I don't know if you've been to LA, but Sunset's, Sunset Boulevard sits quite high. So you've got the Hollywood sign behind <laughs> you. You've got Sunset there. Then you've got downtown LA right down at the bottom there. So he is in a penthouse suite overlooking, stunning views and everything. It was amazing. So we went up there and it was all full of like, oh, hi, baby, and all this. Just so <laughs> fucking, so typical LA people, yeah. you know, which I love the Americans, by the Quite way. over the top, aren't they, the way they talk. Very much so. And as soon as they hear my accent, they're all over like fucking rash, you know what I mean? Which I don't mind. And nice enough, I like the Americans. But um, I'm walking in there and I'm looking around, I'm thinking, that's fucking Sean Penn's gaff, this is all right. All these lovely dolly birds walking about. I thought made it off of them plastic, you know what I mean? But I'm looking around and thinking, well, where's the fucking booze in? There's no booze in the house, right? So I thought, well, you've just got to go straight. And I went to, to Sean Penn. I went, all right, mate, I'm Wolfie, I'm with a band, blah, blah, blah. You got a drink? He went, oh, yeah, hold on. And he picked up the phone and ordered some drinks. I expected an articulated lorry to turn up. No, it was a six pack. <laughs> There's about 30 people in there. There's a six pack, right? So they went in seconds, and I'm up to him again. I said, it's all gone, mate. I went, what, really? And he ordered another six-pack. I thought, oh, for fuck's sake, you're Sean Penn for, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was ridiculous. I couldn't quite believe it. So that was one of the most soberest parties I've ever had in my life. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. <laughs> but mental. Uh, oh, Eric Clapton, he's a, he's a... I didn't like him at all. Oh, really? No, I didn't like him at all. I was a complete knob. Um, we, we, where was we? Um, oh, that's right, we was in Japan. We was in uh, Yokohama, I think. 
and, and it was Roger Daltrey's solo tour, and he was supporting Eric Clapton. So I went along with Roger because I was introducing the band. I was introducing Roger's band, and um, so he was uh, supporting Eric Clapton. So Roger done his bit. I'd, I'd done the intro, come off stage, fucked around in the back backstage in the dressing room, and then I heard someone go, "Right, Eric Clapton's about to turn up." No one look at him, no one approach him. Oh, really? Right, this, their security, right? I went, what do you mean, no one look at him? What's he going to do? Well, get on stage and go, right, everyone turn around. You can only hear. You can't yeah. look at me. I thought, what? I thought, I couldn't believe it. I said, no, don't approach him. Don't, don't even look at him. I thought, yeah, <laughs> red rag to a ball. He walked in, all security. Loads of security around him. Made a grand entrance. So this is just backstage. I went, he had a silly haircut. I went straight up to him. I went... Right, Eric, how's it going? And he looked at me as if a spaceship had just landed on me fucking head, right? <laughs> he couldn't believe I... And he went, yeah, all right. Ah. Off I went. Right? Just to make a point, I later found out that he sat two of his staff for allowing me to go up to him. Really? That's what I heard. I don't know if it's true, but that's yeah. what I heard. So I can... No, I didn't like him one bit. I didn't like him one bit. Um, no need for people to be like that, is there? I mean, if, well, that was if you want that fame and like to be that sort of... Yeah. person then you've yeah. got to accept people coming up to you yeah. and you know, exactly part right. of it exactly and if it weren't for the public they, they'd be yeah, they're not going to be sweeping the are. fucking streets or something That's like right, that yeah. so yeah that that pissed me off so I, I didn't i didn't like him one bit you know what i mean um but apart from that all the rest of the people i met have been wonderful you know what yeah. i mean yeah so, so what sort of age was that when you was doing the tours and stuff not that long ago to be honest with you i suppose it all started uh, 2005, 2006, and I had like um, 10, 12 years of that. Done 10, 12 years of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm still 10, here. 12 years of partying. Exactly, you know what I mean? I'm only 21, look at the state of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. So, yeah, it was, it was life at the top, you know, it, it was just amazing. And don't forget, I had a day job as well. Yeah. Um, I, I used to work, this is how I managed to do it. A lot of people think, ah, oh, fuck, he must be minted. I weren't minted, I had a steady job at the airport. So I'd done four days on, four days off, right? And the four days off, I got 12 days, right? So I used to take four days off, wherever the Who were, or wherever Roger's solo band was, I'd fly out there, do the intros, live the rock star life, come back, do another four days, fuck off again. And that's what I used to do. Yeah. So when I say I was on tour for three months, it wasn't three months solid. I'd still come back. I had to come back to yeah. earn the money. To go back out there. To go back out there. So that's what I was doing. And flights were to a penny because I was in the airline industry. So I could afford it. And flights, they also got really cheap flights, ridiculously cheap. You'd fly around the world for 29 quid. Return, return first class, if you've got an upgrade. Yeah. Ridiculous. So I started saying I was living like a rock star, but without rock star money. <laughs> um, so that's how I managed to do it, really. So, yeah, 2000, and that sort of all finished around about 2013. I, I moved on. I actually, was killing, he was killing me. Yeah. I'd done it all, you know what I mean? I, I, I'd overdone it. <laughs> it was just ridiculous. The body's probably telling you need to break. Oh, fuck it. I, I'm just lucky to be alive to survive it, do you know what I mean? It's ridiculous. The thing is, I've got no off button. Yeah. You know, I just go, 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 and just burn out, you know. Yeah. Have you got any funny stories to tell us about the who? <laughs> Anything you can let out the bag? <laughs> mm. um, get yourself in trouble oh yes this, this, this is it I'll be back. I'll, oh, mm. um, I got told off once by uh, Pete Townsend for partying too hard because um, was was out with Zach you know Zach Starkey he's a drummer for Oasis and The Who um, Ringo Starr's son um, we, we was always out partying you know and getting up to no good and Pete told me off once, he goes, you've got to stop fucking, because it's affecting his drumming, you know, the next yeah. day, it can affect his drumming. So I got told off for being too rock and roll by Pete Townsend, right, can you believe that? <laughs> Unbelievable, <laughs> isn't it? So that's, that's quite a thing to, to oh, and I, I mean, I've got loads of little silly stories like that. I mean, I remember um, Rogers took us out to dinner, where was I, I think, was in Miami, took us out to dinner. There's Roger, Heather, his wife, uh, and the rest of the band, uh, no, Pete and Zach weren't there, but the others, Simon and all the rest of them were there. And we're sitting down and we're having a, having a drink and then Roger got up to go for a slash. 
and Heather was saying, she goes, yeah, and she was sitting next to me. She goes, I can't, she goes, I just can't be asked of it. I said, what's the matter? So she goes, oh, she goes before this to, you know, Roger's got his guitar and he's strumming away, you know, and he's trying to do some uh, Johnny Cash songs and he's strumming away and he's looking at me for my approval. She goes, oh, I can't be fucking arse of all that. She goes, I went up and done the wash up. I went out and done the wash up. <laughs> right. So we're all laughing, right? The whole table was laughing as Roger came back and he sat down and he goes, what are you laughing at? I went, no, nothing, Roger. Just sit down, mate. <laughs> oh, you are sitting down. <laughs> he didn't like that very much because he's only five foot nothing, isn't he? So, um, so there was, yeah, they had, a, they had a clean ones, I can tell, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I've been told off quite a lot of times by, the, by uh, some band members. Roger's right, totally against his smoking, right? Right. He used to smoke a bit of weed. He don't smoke anything anymore. But he hates cigarettes and he, he says it affects his voice and that. So I thought for a laugh, I went out and um, found this huge display advertising Marlborough and the cigarette packet was about five foot tall. So I nicked that and put it in Roger's dressing room. <laughs> he wasn't very happy about that either. <laughs> so I sort of pushed it to the limits a bit, yeah. do you know what I mean? I suppose if you're out on them sort of tours, you, you've got to have a little bit of a laugh and yeah. a joke to keep you going, don't you? I mean, you've got to, to make it fun. You, well, yeah, I mean, to me it was all fun anyway, but I, I'm a bit of a joker anyway, do you know what I mean? And it's yeah. sort of expected from me, you know what I mean? Roger, another time I there's this huge display of Roger, I think it was in Paris at the time, I some fucking way, and it's a huge display of Roger advertising his solo tour. So I took the display, and it was like seven foot tall, this fucking great big cardboard thing. So I nicked that, and I put it in the band's dressing room, right? So as soon as they walk in, they've just got a seven foot figure of Roger standing in front of them, <laughs> right? And then who was the first person to walk in was Roger. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, oh, here we go. And he went, who the fucking hell put that there? Wolfie! <laughs> <laughs> he knew straight away he was me. <laughs> but yeah, little things like that, it just makes the world go round, yeah, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Have a laugh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you've got to have a laugh, man. Makes it all fun. I mean, because one time, I mean, when... Um, was, uh, on Hol was on tour and was in Verona in Italy... And it's this beautiful, ancient amphitheatre. And I think it's the oldest one in the world. And um, where, where the uh, dressing, dressing rooms were, was where they, that the Christians were kept, right. ready to be fed to the lions, or the lions were kept there, in the vaults of this amazing, ancient building. And it started to rain, and the rain was coming down. It was coming through the rocks. It was actually raining in the dressing room. It was really? unbelievable. It was unbelievable. <laughs> and so Roger went out, on stage, I'd done the intro and all that. The Italians are fucking nuts anyway. Very passionate about their music. And um, the rain came teeming down, but it was like sheet rain. The rain was almost horizontal going towards the stage. And Roger, well, that, that had to cover all the uh, amps up with uh, plastic and stuff. Uh, and Roger got soaked. And then he pretended that his voice went, right, because he had the ump. Right? He pretended. I knew he was fucking joking. I knew he was pretending. He ain't gonna like this if he sees it. It's tough shit. Right? <laughs> and he, and he, his voice went. And then Rex, the, the tour manager, he went on stage and, and he said, "What, blah, blah, blah. And Roger's fucking throwing a hissy fit. Right? And he just stormed off. The Italians was going fucking mental because they want their money's worth. Yeah. They want their pound of flesh. For yeah. They've been wait, waiting all year for this. Yeah. Roger got a bit wet and fucked off. Right? I thought, that's not way, not way to treat the fans. So I went backstage, I said, Roger, what's going on? He goes, ah, oh, fucking ain't doing it. And I said, look, I've come all this way to see you. Uh, and he goes, well, I've come all this fucking way and all. I went, but they want to see you. Oh, he had a fucking his fit. Anyway, he went back on stage, still pissing down the rain, done a few more songs, and he pretended that his voice went, oh, uh, 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 bullshit, yeah. and fucked off. So the next day, that was in Verona, and where was we the next day? Switzerland, I think, I can't remember. Uh, I, went, uh, <laughs> I went into Roger's dressing room, I went, you right, Roger? You all right, Wolf, yeah, come in, want a drink? Yeah, have a drink. He goes, uh, what do you think of the tour so far? I said, yeah, it's all right. I says, apart from Verona. He goes, what do you mean? I says, well, we sounded shit towards the end, didn't you? He looked at me, he couldn't believe what I just said. <laughs> my missus was standing next to him she went straight next door to the, to the, to the guy's dressing room went in there and said you ain't going to believe what Wolfie just said to Roger that he sounded shit 
<laughs> and they went, fucking hell, is he still standing? Right? So when I did say that, he looked at me, he took his glasses off like that, he looked at me, turned around, walked the other way, and I thought, he's going to hit me. <laughs> or something's going to happen, he's going to tell me to fuck off. And he came around and he looked me in the eye and he went, you know what? You're right. He goes, it was shit. <laughs> I thought, well, at least he's honest, admitted it. Yeah. Most people would fucking, I would deck you, I would tell you to fuck off, you yeah. know what I mean? So, you know, little stories like that. Yeah. Make, make well, I suppose if you're being honest with him, it's not like... Uh, yeah. No, no, I'm not sucking up to him. He's just telling the truth. Telling the truth. That's right. And, and the thing is, with most celebrities, I suppose, they, they hate people sucking up to them because yeah. this, they can see through it like a bloody x-ray, do you know what I mean? You know, there's this bird... I met quite a few women over the parties, as you can imagine, and <laughs> I took one of these girls backstage. She goes, I'd love to meet Roger. Sick of fans, right? So I said, well, you play your cards right, darling, you know what I mean? <laughs> so she did play her cards right, and I took her backstage, right? <laughs> and uh, we're sitting there after the gig, and uh, Roger walked in, and this bird went, oh, Roger, you're so amazing. He looked at her as if he just fucking stepped in something and just walked straight back out again. He don't like it. Yeah. He don't like the, uh, the sucking up and uh, adulation. I suppose in the early days, he, he lapped it up, all the adulation yeah. and the superstardom and, and stuff like that. But when you've done it for 50 years, it's probably got some bit, fucking yeah. tits, yeah. Yeah, cool. So by being honest, by being brutally honest, I think that sort of paved the way to friendship. Yeah. If you like. Yes. That's, that's the thing, isn't it? If it's getting the truth out of you, it's going to sort of trust you as a yeah. character more. Yeah, yeah. That's Rather it. than if he knew he was crap and you say, oh, you were brilliant, you just yeah. tell him what he wants to hear, aren't you? you know yeah, I mean? it doesn't mean anything. No, it's it's hollow. Yeah. There's no substance to it. So, yeah. so that's why I always, I'm always i always brutally honest with people. I if I think you're being a wanker, I'll tell you you're being a wanker. Yeah. And if you think I'm being a wanker, tell me. Yeah. It's the best tell, way in life, isn't it? Just yeah. to uh, be it, honest. Yeah. It, if I'm being a complete arsehole and you're letting me get away with it, how am I going to know when to stop being an arsehole? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. This is, you need to be told sometimes. Yeah. Someone needs to pull you back in line sometimes, don't they? Exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. You know, and I expect that if you're a friend, and if I'm being a dick, tell me I'm being a dick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I'll fucking tell you if you're being a dick. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Simple yeah. as that. Can I just jump back when we're yeah. talking about the scooters and the... Sure, um, yeah. Was you actually in a, a scooter club as well? Like yeah. In, in the old days? Well, I've always... See, I've always, I've never joined another club. I've always had my own clubs. Right. So I've always been the founder member, president number one, if you like, of the scooter club. So yeah, I've always been like, dare I say it, the leader. <laughs> it sounds fucking dreadful, but it's true. I've, I've never been, I'm non-conformist, yeah. like I said. So. Are you still involved in it now? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Still I still organise stuff and yeah, yeah, still involved with it. Uh, not as much as I had, I have been because I've been busy, you know what I mean? I, my life's changed, it's moved on. So not as much as I used to, you know. Yeah. So yeah, um, always had my own scooter clubs, always uh, organised events. Uh, still do the Great London Ride Out, which attracts about a thousand scooters, go through London to South End. Do that, that's my one, Great London Ride Out. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, so I organise that, that's mine. Yeah. Done it for 20 years now. Is that, is that the one, the bikes, where all bikes go, not just no, the scooters? No, scoot, just, just scooters. Just the, scooter the Great London Ride Out. Yeah, right. I do it every year at South End. I haven't done it the past two years, obviously, because this shit has been going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, COVID, obviously. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my baby. That's what I do. And it's, we make headlines in the local newspaper, TV, radio interviews, you know, and it's all done in a good cause. Put a bit towards charity, keep them happy. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I still organise that. Um, uh, I've gone more into different directions, but all to do with entertainment and showbiz, I suppose. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But I don't do so much as I used to in the scooter scene. No, I've done it all. That's the thing. Yeah. Uh, where do you draw the line? You know. That's right. Yeah, I've done it all. That's, that's the thing. Sometimes you like to move on and do different stuff, don't you? Yeah. I've been living. Otherwise, out. it gets boring. Otherwise, you're living in a circle, aren't you? Yeah, so no, fucking like Groundhog Day. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so I've done it all. But I, I enjoyed it all immensely. I've got no regrets. You know. Yeah. So. I loved every bit of it, and I still love the mod thing. As you can see, I still dress in that style. You know what I mean? I just, I just love it. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't change anything if you had could live your life again. Would you live the same path if you done? Oh fuck me, without yeah. a doubt, man. <laughs> oh man, it's been a roller coaster. I, I, I just, I feel very lucky. You know, I've, it's sort of, um, and it's not as if I've, like I said, it's not as if I've gone out. 
to be this person or gone out to meet these people. You know, yeah. I haven't made a beeline for it. I, I'm not obsessed. I haven't got an obsession, you know. Uh, it, it just happened. So I feel very lucky that it happened yeah. to me, you know. Because, it's, I mean, if you're a Chelsea fan and you end up being mates with the whole of Chelsea Football Club and they're your mates, yeah. that's going to be quite something, right? Yeah, of course it is. Well, with me, that's the U. Quite a lucky position to get, get yourself in, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, to, yeah, so reiterating, going back to what your, your question was, would I change anything? No, I fucking would not. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I would, I would do it all over again. That's been a fucking one hell of a ride. So, so where's, your, where's your life sort of gone to now? What sort of things are you doing now? Well, now, um, I've gone from the music business into the film business now. Right, okay. So, I've sort of, I'm an independent filmmaker, loosely. You know, I make my own silly little comedy clips, you know, and yeah. stuff like that. Um, but now I've gone seriously, into, I've given up everything, I've, gone, I've thrown myself into acting now. Right. So I do, I do a lot of acting. Um, um, comedy, I do a bit of comedy, I, I do a little bit of writing, a little bit of everything really, just to keep me occupied, just to keep me flowing along yeah. nicely. So yeah, so um, I'm, I'm in the acting game now, yeah. which I enjoy immensely. It's really good. Not as crazy as the rock and roll lifestyle <laughs> no. I had. <laughs> Nothing going to be like that level. No, 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 no. Nothing's going to. Nothing's going to touch that. But the, <laughs> but, but the, uh, but uh, the acting game is great. I mean, I, the, the the people that I meet, absolutely bonkers. Most of them, outgoing extroverts. You know, there's no shrinking violets in the film industry. They're all out there. You know what I mean? Like crazy. Yeah. Look at me. <laughs> you know uh, and. The characters that I meet just makes the world go round for me. I've met some amazing people, you know, which I would never have met in if I wasn't in that industry. And that's how I met Roy on a on a first yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we met and uh, here we are still. Yeah, 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 here we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I well, mean, no, 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 no. What's that? Uh, Debbie does Dallas, who's in that one? Yeah, yeah. I'd have done that free. Yeah, I bet you would, yeah. I think most people would, yeah. Bloody hell. Yeah. So, so where can you see your life going for now, Wolfie? What, um, what can you see the future holds for you? Well, um, I think I'm going to go put myself back into promotion again. Listen, I'm in the acting game. Um, I, I still like to manage bands and do a bit of promotional work. I still quite enjoy that. But I think acting is my main game now. I mean, we've got, done TV series, we've got films coming out, and it's all looking good. So hopefully that's going to pick up. Yeah. But I'm not going to hold my breath on that. If I, I'm not going out there to, to be the next Brad Pitt or anything like that. But it's just good fun seeing it all unfold in front of me, seeing yeah. how the film has been put together, you know, backstage and uh, behind the scenes. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to do. I've written my autobiography, so that's coming out in December. I'm going to get that scripted. Yep. Um, and then I'm going to push that around to various film directors that I know in the hope that people think that might be a good film. For, yeah, to make a film from the book. From the book. Yeah, it normally happens, doesn't it? And people do a book first. And then, and then the film. Film after, or documentary. Yep. Then a... that's, that's what I'm looking at. That, so yeah. that's where the future is right now. Beyond that, who knows? Yeah. But it won't be boring. Whatever happens, it won't be boring. Quite an active life you've lived. Still living it, I'm here. <laughs> huh? This is rock and roll, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so looking forward to that and hopefully uh, just go along with the flow. And um, like I say, I'm meeting some great people. We've got a TV series coming out soon called Join the Queue from uh, Poly Art. Uh, there's a pilot film coming out, I think, in November or December. Um, and then that's going to be turned into a series, which is going to go out uh, Amazon Prime or Netflix, one of those. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be an ongoing series, so that's going to take up a lot of my time. Yeah. I'll be filming two or three days every week, and it's going to be one of them films, uh, one of them series that is never ending. You know, yeah. it's an ongoing thing. Like an EastEnders type of thing, it yeah. just keeps going and going. Like EastEnders, Coronation Street, I think it was only screened, I think, for about seven or eight episodes. And it's still going 50 years later. Yeah. So I'm hoping this one is going to be the same. And we've got some really good directors. Uh, can, very can you tell us a little bit about that? Or is it still too yeah, uh, No, I can, say, I can say a little bit about it. It's called Join the Queue. Um, I, I play a uh, um, snooker manager. Right. So I'm the snooker king. And, and what happens is that um, 
<laughs> someone's there's a bit of a turf war going on. Someone's nicking my name, right? So I go in there to confront them, and I meet up with this geezer who thinks he's the real snooker king, but I'm the snooker king. So there's a little bit of rivalry going on there, mm -hmm. and then bets are placed. So what it is, the stakes are getting running higher and higher and higher. I bring in these different people because I'm the agent, the manager, snooker. I trained Ronnie O'Sullivan and Harry Kniggins and all that, right? So I'm the top boy in London for snooker, and I'm bringing in all these different snooker players to up the ante, do you know what I mean? So it's really interesting because you're getting these different characters that are coming in from different backgrounds, um, and I'm in the centre of it all. I'm arranging it all. Um, and then I can't say too much more about it, but that's basically the idea yeah. of it. But yeah. it gets really interesting and deep, and there's hidden messages in there. It's never been done before, so I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, and when, when's that due to come out? We've done the last bit of filming uh, six weeks ago. There's another shoot with the last, the final bit is November the 16th, I think. So it should hopefully be out December or January. And that'll go straight to Netflix, will it? Straight in as a pilot film, 25 yeah. minute pilot film, which is really good. Um, it's great fun, you know, um, it's off the wall a little bit. Yeah. It's never been done before, it's a new idea. Uh, and then, if there's enough, uh, I mean, this geezer's won awards, you know, he's yeah. on the Cannes Film Festival, so this is one of the professionals, unlike some of the stuff that we've done, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, you know what I mean? You can vouch for that. But um, <laughs> no, not mention any names. <laughs> but, um, so, um, so that's really good. So I'm looking forward to that. And we've got some great yeah. film. So it depends on sponsorship and if people want to put in money, there's enough money there in the pot to bring it forward to the next stage. Yeah. So that's really exciting. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. It's going to keep me out of prison. <laughs> out of <the> park. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, that's all that means. It's exciting times ahead. So, anything else you got for us, Wolfie? Any other stories? Oh, blimey. Any other stories I've got for you? We're trying to fish a couple more out of you before we wrap up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're trying to fish a couple more out of me. Uh, right, let's think. <sighs> TV's out the window. Done that. And it was plugged in at the time. That wasn't a very good idea. It didn't even get it. It smashed the window, but it just bounced back and hit me on the head. So. <laughs> well, you uh, went to throw the telly out the window. Yeah, it was plugged in. It bounced <laughs> off the window and fucking hit me. Uh, I've not told anyone that, but yeah, that's what happened. Uh, so, people say, oh, it's all been done before. Yeah, but I ain't fucking done it before. So yeah. I want to throw the TV out the window, which didn't go down too well anyway. But uh, yeah, um, Roger's jet was on there once and... Um, was, where was we going? From Charlotte to, fuck knows, somewhere else in America. It's just a like 45 minute flight. And um, they're quite amazing actually, because if from Charlotte to Orlando or somewhere like that, if you went by a commercial airline, that probably, t it's a 45 minute flight, it could probably take about two or three hours by the time you go through security. Uh, taxi to the airport, taxi from the airport to your hotel. It could take two, three, maybe four hours, right? We went from backstage, in the limo, police escort, straight to the airport, no barrier opened up, no ID, no screen checks, no nothing, straight onto the private jet, bosh, done. The whole lot, 45 minutes. Blimey. From backstage to the hotel. Fucking I suppose that's how, like, you see them in different, uh, like, doing it. The, the DJs and that they'd be like New Year's Eve they're in lo loads of different countries but I suppose that's how they do it yeah they go with the times don't they yeah yeah it's so. unbelievable uh, and great fun on the private jet as well you know all d'oeuvres and drinks are plenty two of cocaine <laughs> so, oh, so I wasn't going to mention that but now you've said it <laughs> quite easy quite easily I mean the drugs have been left on the plane and do they do, they, do not Get searched, no, really go through for nothing, stuff like that. No. Nothing, nothing at all. Straight through. So really, like anyone sort of famous that's going through private jet. No, they've fucking got shitloads of coaching. No, no, absolutely. I mean, one of the members of the Who, I can't say which one. Oh, ex member of the Who, should we say? Yes. Uh, he had a big fucking lump of hash, right? And he left it on a private jet. And he come back, he'd done the gig, and then he goes to me, fuck, Wolfie, you're gonna skin up for me? I said, I ain't got nothing. He goes, oh, I've just left my fucking gear on the plane. Oh, fuck it. So he rung up someone up, says, go to the private jet, pick up my gear and bring it back, and that's what he'd done, right? 
So, really, yeah, you can you could get away with murder. Yeah. Literally, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I, I'm not saying it happens, but it might have done. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so one time we're going from there and um, they, they put in a bet. So we, there was me, Roger, ex-missus, Simon, his missus, tour manager, one or two others on this little Learjet, it's only a little thing. And, um, and they all had a bet to see how long it would take to get from Charlotte to Orlando. So I calculated it out for like 45 minutes. We should probably land about nine o'clock tonight, right? Worked it all out. Mine was nine o'clock or something like that, or 46 minutes. Roger said 48 minutes, Rex, blah, blah, and all that did all, so $10 bet, right? Worked it all out. We're counting down as we're coming in to land. We're counting it down, five, four, and, and it's quite exciting actually because there's very close between who was going to yeah. win the bet. Very, very tight. And I've actually filmed it. I've actually filmed it. So I've okay. got it somewhere. I've got some footage <laughs> of it somewhere. And we slammed down in Orlando. And, um, and the tour manager won the bet. So he was about $80, $90 up. Right? So everyone paid. Except for one person. Who was that, do you think? God. Roger. <laughs> oh, I ain't got any money on me. Can I owe it to her? I thought, that's fucking typical, <laughs> that, isn't it? <laughs> hey, you know what I mean? The man who charges £80,000 just to walk on stage. Bloody Didn't hell. even have 10 bucks on him to pay the bet. <laughs> well, you always find out of people with money. The, the more money uh, they've got, the time That's they true, are. mate. That's very true. That's very, very true. <laughs> and I believe that. That's why he's worth 80 million quid. You know what I mean? Oh, that's a bit of dough. Yeah. yeah. I said to you once, why don't you keep, why don't you keep touring? Now, I know why he keeps touring. I just wanted to hear what he said. Um, he goes, well, who's going to feed the grandkids? Good answer. Yeah. They must have about 30 of them. Do you, do you find that like, sometimes, I mean, when like, um, I don't know, like um, Xboxers or footballers, when they finish their being the top of their game, mm. they don't really, they can't find anything else to live for, can yeah. they? So they sort of, their status sort of drops and they sort of, you know, there's a, there's a few boxers that have sort of you know, gone off right off the yeah. rails, isn't off to the rails. to go yeah. to pieces and uh, I think it's hard to, well, you're a very popular person to suddenly be, uh, sort of forget about you a little bit, don't they? It's got to be devastating, mate. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, and they, they turn to booze or drugs and... Well, exactly, you yeah, know, it's like a... Or eating disorders or, or, or they just go off the rails completely and go into depression and stuff like yeah. that. Well, that's which, it, yeah, which so is, many of them like that. It's tragic, they? it's yeah. tragic. And I think that's why a lot of uh, rock stars and film stars keep doing what they're doing because if they give it all up, they wouldn't know what the fuck to do. Yeah. They'd lose themselves. Yeah. They can't handle sort of reality, if you like, you know? Yes, right, yeah. So, that, so I think that's why, yeah, a lot of people keep doing what they're doing. Yeah. Even if they're fucking rubbish at it, they still do it because it keeps them sane, you know? Yeah, I mean? of course. Like, gives That's them a perfect growth. example of like Paul Gascoigne, isn't it? Got yeah. Off yeah. the rails after his football yeah. career. George Best is another one. Yeah. You know, tragic, really. Yeah. You know, but Salavi, as they say in France. Anything else you want to get out before we can wind up? Uh, no, I'm going to. I'm going to behave myself. Yeah, myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we start one up then, Wolfie. Right, Thank you so much for coming. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Cheers, mate.